find some space, sit down and listen to a living legend right here on the stage. Get your cameras ready because this makes the hair on the back of my neck tingle uh, and it's, uh, it's going to be fantastic. So I'm going to bring them on stage in just two minutes time. So Hey, how good is this? Look at the crowd. The crowd are amazing. I always get a few goosebumps every year at exactly this time because this is one of the special treats that I get. I'm a very blessed man that I get to do this up on stage. Um, and I'm sure you've come to see him. You haven't come to see me. Ladies and gentlemen, the living legend that is Mr. Sir Sterling Moss. <laughs> about that, ladies and gentlemen, to Sterling Moss right here on the stage. Um, Good morning, everybody. Morning. Fantastic. Morning. Um, now, Sterling, a uh, couple of anniversaries coming up for you. Uh, next year, we've got the 60th anniversary of the Million Million. Yeah, 60 years. I'm amazing. 60 years. I feel really old when I see that. <laughs> 1955, that was, you yeah. and Jenks. Yeah, it's 25 years old. It's amazing. 25 years old. I remember um, talking to you last year about that particular race and about how you had the fight with the uh, 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 with the other teams out there. But there was that particular moment that Jenks had written in his book that after eight hours of doing the Millia Millia, he had thrown up in his crash helmet several times and he looked across at you and you clapped your hands and you went, this is the good bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, that was over the foot of the Radicophony. Yeah. Can you remember those days like it was yesterday? Oh, oh very certain. I mean, the races like that, yes. Because they're quite unique. It was the only race that I was actually frightened of. Oh, yeah, I worried, worried about it because it was, it was all the dangerous times anyway. But that one was particularly dangerous because I didn't know where I was going, to, you know, where I was going until we had this thing, roller map thing, that uh, uh, was actually was thought about by a chap called John Fitch in America. And uh, he, he had asked, He'd asked James if he'd come with me, and he said yes, but then luckily he changed his mind as he came with me, so we had the, the benefit of this roller map, which was about 17 yards long, and, it, and Jenks was giving me signals, because there was no way, even the very latest uh, intercoms there, it wouldn't work with all the noise in, in an SLR. And uh, so we had to do all hand signals. Absolutely fantastic. If you, if you want to know what the roller map is, basically it's wallpaper, in a roller map, and it was the, they sort of pioneered, if you like, GPS satellite navigation. Uh, they would ride along, so Sterling behind the wheel, and Jenks would crank the roller map and say, "Coming up next is a right-hand bend and a long straight." That's yeah. pretty correct, isn't yeah, well, it? Well, he, except he couldn't speak, of course. I mean, just wait. He would give me signals like that means slow down a bit. That would mean slow down a hell of a lot, and <laughs> things like that. And so I, I could see him out of the corner of my eye because obviously I was concentrating on the road. And Jenks was sitting beside me, but he had his hand up here, and I could see it. And uh, I just don't know what speed we would have done with it without, without having that. I mean, it would be much, much slower because, you know, we're going up hills, long hills into towns, say 160, 170 miles an hour. And obviously, we wouldn't know what was the other side, except he had it noted down. In other words, if he go like, like this, would mean flat out, and then he'd go, go like this, and then slow down the right hand, show me the right hand corner. And that's what, the way we, we spoke to each other for, like, for 10 hours. And who would have thought that was 60 years ago, and here you are 60 years later, still talking about it? Yeah. And next year, I gather you're on a bit of a whirlwind tour around the world talking about the Miller Million. Yeah, because the Mercedes are going to be taking the car's number, it was 722 on it, which meant it started at 722 in the morning. And the first car, of course, was 20, I think it was 2300, which one of the little Fiat's or something like that and then right through the field and I was 7.22 in the morning and you've got to remember that the cars went at 30 second intervals from 9 o'clock at night till midnight there's 360 cars whatever it is and then we, we then uh, after that uh, the um, uh, one minute intervals when the faster cars went I was 7.22 in the morning and I still wasn't the last car so if you add all that up you'll see there are about seven, six seven hundred entries now, I mean, there aren't six or seven hundred people who could be much capable of racing, you know. I mean, the, the Italian hairdressers would go fast to take down the centre and all that. But uh, anybody could go there. I mean, you go along with your car and, and uh, I, d I don't know if one even paid an entry fee. 
I certainly didn't pay it, but you say these would have done. It would have done. Yeah. Yeah. yeah fantastic. Well, we can't wait to see what happens for you next year with that. We're looking forward uh, to the celebrations. But there is another anniversary next year, and it'll be the anniversary of the first British driver to win in a British car at Aintree, and that's 60th Tony, anniversary, isn't it, yeah, of that as well. And you are that man. Tell us yeah, about that. Uh, uh, well, with Tony Brooks, I mean, uh, who, I mean, amazing driver. He really was, and uh, I mean, people, the enthusiasts here will obviously know who he was, but unless you were enthusiasts, you wouldn't know, and yet he was, in my mind, you know, one of the finest drivers ever, ever to take, the, take a wheel. Fantastic. Yeah. So um, Aintree, uh, most people know that today as a, as a race course, but it was a, a very famous and great racing circuit back in the day, wasn't oh, it? Yeah. Oh, certainly. I mean, uh, we had to cross the track, actually, where the horses were, but, uh, I think two, one or two places. But, uh, of course, had the enormous grandstands and all that business, and uh, it, it worked very well. I mean, very, in those days, of course, Formula One races had to be, or, or Grand Prix had to be at least three hours in length. So sometimes, I mean, I won the Monaco Grand Prix in, in 1961, this is Monaco now, and that took me three and three quarter hours. Wow. Yeah, wow. You know, now they do an hour, ten, ten in, minutes in, and in the commercials, you see. <laughs> yeah, and they get out and they're knackered. Yeah, you did three and a half hours three in the car. Hours, yeah. That's amazing. Um, uh, earlier on today, uh, earlier on, sorry, this year, uh, I know you lost a, a dear friend of yours, uh, Sir Jack Brabham, yeah, and that must yeah. have been uh, uh, horrible yeah. for you and his family. Uh, but I got to spend a bit of time with his son David, and you and David took part in a parade, uh, I do believe, at Silverstone this year. That's right. And yeah. David told me something wonderful, and I just want to share it with you. Uh, David said, he said, I had just, I, I, I can't do it in his accent, but it was like yeah. I, I had a boyhood dream. He said, I was behind to Sterling Moss. He was in the Mercedes, and I'm behind him on the Silverson circuit. This is this year. And he said, we're coming into, into a couple of the bends. And he said, so Sterling is downshifting and blipping the throttle in between the downshifts. And he said, the hair on the back of my neck was standing on end. He said, I had tears in my eyes because it was what my dad would have done. He would have been chasing oh, to Sterling. Be, well, I'd be ch chasing him or he'd be chasing me. me. Yeah. Well, I must say, I had I literally hundreds of races against Jack. And we drove, uh, we actually, uh, we, Jack used to jump the start and we uh, I was co-driving with him in a Holden Tirana or something in Australia. And I said to Jack, look, you, you start first, because first of all, you're Australian, you're unlikely to dock your time. And secondly, you know, we, I think you, you go pretty quickly. And he said, okay, and uh, everything got ready. The guy dropped the flag and he stalled the engine. So, <laughs> And unfortunately, the guy behind hit him up in the arse, and so we, so we, had, we had to wait, wait about you know 20 minutes to repair to repair before we could get going. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, let me just bring um, bring it full circle to today. Uh, what do you think? I know you spend a lot of time still with Mercedes Benz. Uh, what do you think of the current crop of, of racing drivers, Lewis Hamilton, uh, Rosberg? Oh, what do you think of these guys? Oh, they're tremendous. I mean, they really are. I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to drive the cars they do, but then when they see a car that I drove, I mean, Lewis said, God, I wouldn't get in that thing. You know, it looks so flimsy by comparison. Yeah. But the, the, no, I think the, the drivers today are as good as they ever were. I think any, any era that the drivers go as fast as they can, at, at that time and uh, I mean the cars obviously are very much more sophisticated and all these problems I mean the, they get a lot of tire tar flatting in a way where then makes it unbalanced well we, we hadn't got good enough brakes to do that so it's pretty easy you know? <laughs> but, uh, no, I, mean, I, I, I think Formula 1 racing is still very interesting yeah good I really do there's been a couple of cracking races recently yeah yeah, yeah. I'm really excited. But the good news is we haven't lost a driver, I think it's now 30 years. Yeah. Which, which when in my day, it was, you know, three or four every year. So it's an amazing step forward that way. Yeah, the safety is incredible. Yeah. Um, what do you think? I mean, these people here, you know, they've come to see you at the Classic Motor Show. They can find you here. Actually, you're doing autograph signing sessions, aren't you? I'm doing, quite, yeah, quite a few of them, actually. It's listed up if you go where I'm meant to be. This, this is my off time. This, this is, is your off time. This is nice and relaxing with you all. See? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, what do you think, uh, Sir Sterling, of the Classic Motor Show? Have you had a chance to have a look round? <laughs> Not really. I think it's, I th I'm really 
it staggers me every time I see it. I mean, you know, what's here, yeah, the beauty of the cars. I mean, they're, they're so much better, obviously, than when they were built, you know. I mean, there isn't a car here that's, well, of course, what their value is now. I mean, the it's cars, incredible. absolutely incredible. I mean, I bought a Maserati Formula One car in 1954, and they charged me if about just under three, four, about three to four thousand pounds. If I kept the damn thing to now, that would be worth about five, six million. <laughs> So, so don't, don't throw anything away, just buy a bigger house. <laughs> There's a lesson learned for you. Um, so Sterling, I could honestly sit here and do this all day with you. It's an absolute honour to do this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, wasn't that wonderful? Did you enjoy that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for the one and only Sir Sterling Moss. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe I'll see you going around somewhere. There you are, sir. How incredible is that? It's still going. The hair is still going on the back of my neck. Wow, that was fantastic.